the next part of or the next section of content for um, our second unit um, is on pretty much um, the torso bones and nervous system structures. Um, the other day, you guys learned about the muscles of the torso. And so now we're going to add in the nervous system and the skeletal system structures. Remember that in this class, we approach the body from a regional approach as opposed to a systemic approach, right? So we are focusing on the torso, bones, muscles, nerves therein. And of course, adding a little bit of physiology in that is applicable to the entire body. Okay, so there is no single chapter that I can refer you to for this particular content. Um, and so I have shown, I've given you here the oops, uh, different sections of the different chapters that are relevant to this part of the lesson. Okay, so again, we are thinking about the torso and how the bones, muscles, and nerves interact with one another, control one another, inform one another. Uh, so in the first unit of this class, we talked a lot about neurons there towards the end, right before the lecture exam. And here we can see a neuron, right? So this, um, as we know, has a series of um, sensory structures. Okay, so this is essentially detecting a signal, whether it's, you know, some kind of stimulus in the skin or, you know, binding to um, some kind of molecule in the food that you ate, or it is actually receiving messages from other neurons, right? So again, the dendrites are receptive. If the stimulus is strong enough, we know that this depolarization, you know, exceeds threshold and generates an action potential within the axon hillock and the action potential travels in a single direction down the axon. This electrical signal is then converted into a chemical signal in the synaptic terminals or axon terminals or synaptic knobs or you know any of these terms that you prefer to use and neurotransmitters are released to a postsynaptic cell. All right, so that content did not go away. That will be important until the very end of our class here together. Um, but now we get to build on it. Okay. In class, I drew for you a neuron that looked kind of like this. And of course, you got to use your imagination a little bit, but this is the type of neuron that we talked about the most. It is called a unipolar neuron. And what this term means is uni one polar um, kind of like end. Um, and so what this is referring to on a neuron is the fact that there is a single branch off of the soma or the cell body of the neuron. Here we can see the dendrites, one single long axon. And of course, um, the cell body is kind of like a branch off of this super long axon. Um, these are the neurons that are found most commonly as sensory neurons in the PNS that is the peripheral nervous system, right? So when we talked about stimuli, um, in unit one, we were talking about, um, you know, brushing against your skin or pressing down upon it or heat or any of those types of stimuli. They are being sensed in the periphery of the body, right? There are a couple other types of neurons and all of which are going to become important for us before the end of the term. Um, here, we can see a bipolar neuron. Okay, so here's the cell body, but instead of having a single branch off of the cell body or soma, we have two, right? So dendrites on one side and a single axon on the other. Now, unlike the sensory neurons, these are by far the least common in the body. In fact, we won't really see them come into play until the last unit of the course where we start to talk about the special senses. Okay, so our taste, our sight, our hearing, all of those special senses require the use of bipolar neurons. Okay. Um, also very common are multipolar neurons. In fact, these are the most common type of neurons in our body. Here we can see the soma or cell body and many branches off of them. So lots of dendrites and a single axon to either send a message or not send a message given the sum of all of the different stimuli and all of these dendrites. Okay. These are the most common because they are motor neurons, right? That is, they are taking a signal not to the brain so that we can kind of think about what that 
heat on our skin actually means to us how we should respond. Instead, these motor neurons are taking a decision from our brain down to the rest of the body, right? So how should we respond to, you know, feeling a hot something on our fingers? Well, we should move our fingers the heck out of the way and then, you know, go from there. Uh, so motor neurons are carrying decisions from the central nervous system. Um, the central nervous system itself utilizes these multipolar neurons more than any other type of neuron. And interneurons, which we're going to see, um, kind of uh, relay the message from, from uh, sensory neurons to the motor neurons. Right? So they are taking um, you know, whatever the sensory information is and relaying it to the rest of the body for some kind of a decision, some kind of response. Okay. Um, the, when we look at these, we see that there are a lot of opportunities for information to come into this neuron. And so it makes sense that in our central nervous system, we have a lot of opportunities to take in different bits of information. Okay. It is hot. Okay. You know, I see this amount of light. I remember that heat means this. And when you put your hand near or on the stove, that is a problem. And so there should be a lot, a lot, a lot of different bits of information coming in to produce one single response for your body. Okay, so all of these multipolar neurons are taking in lots of information from our brain, from the rest of our body, whatever, and we have one opportunity to respond, to get our hand off the stove or whatever, given all of these different bits of information. Okay. Um, we also know that unlike muscles, neurons can produce an action potential that runs in a single direction. Right. And the reason that it runs in a single direction is because of that refractory period, right? Um, so as the action potential passes, this area becomes refractive. Uh, so this area becomes refractive. Um, and so the action potential can't go back in the other direction. Um, so all of these different types of neurons represent the functional units of the nervous system. Um, yes. Uh, they are super common. Yes, they give rise to the function of this entire organ system, but in fact, they are not the only cells that the nervous system is made of, that the nervous system needs in order um, to work, essentially. Don't know why this keeps going back and forth today. I'm really sorry about that. Um, so the nervous system is an organ system, right? A series of organs all working together towards a common goal. We know that neurons, of course, are the functional portion of that story, but organs themselves actually contain multiple types of tissue working together as well. And so nervous tissue contains the neurons, but also it contains other types of cells called neuroglia. Right? So these neuroglial cells are going to help the neurons and we need them to function properly so that we can actually send electrical signals via the neurons. We've already met one particular type of neuroglial cell and that is a Schwann cell. Right? We know that Schwann cells um, contain a lot of lipids, so lots of these um, uh, fats, right? Um, and these Schwann cells wrap around the axon of the cells that we've been talking about, right? So of those uh, unipolar neurons. Um, and essentially what they do is they insulate the axon to make the action potential travel much more quickly. Okay, so the Schwann cells are found in the peripheral nervous system only. Okay. And their job, right, the way that they give rise to the function of the entire organ, the entire organ system, is that they insulate the axons. Okay, and we also know that there are little gaps in between them called nodes of Ranvier, and this is where the uh, action potentials are kind of regenerated. And so it looks like the action potentials kind of leap from gap to gap or node to node. Okay. Um, sometimes these Schwann cells. Um, have other functions depending on what types of cells we're looking at. Um, just throwing out there, Schwann cells can be found around unmyelinated neurons, right? So some of our neurons do not have this insulated or these insulating properties. Um, and so here the Schwann cells are simply functioning to stabilize the axon, axons and protect them, 
right? So um, that is a minor component, but just throwing it out there, there's a little bit more to the Schwann cell story, okay? A second type of cell that's really important in the peripheral nervous system is satellite cells. Okay, so satellite cells um, essentially um, are these tiny little branched cells that are regulating the external environment of the neurons. Um, remember in our lab that you guys did um, actually together in breakout groups, you guys kind of played with the amount of sodium and potassium in the extracellular environment. Um, and what you saw was that the action or that the resting membrane potential could change just based on what was outside of the cell. Um, and so there are a lot of different variables that go into the functionality of the neuron. Satellite cells make sure that there's just the right amount of sodium, just the right amount of potassium. And you know, there's not a lot of chemicals and hormones and all those other types of things. They pretty much just kind of clean up the environment around these neurons within the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so note that Schwann cells are blue and underlined. Those are important satellite cells here, blue and underlined. Those are important cells within the peripheral nervous system. Okay. In the central nervous system, that is in the brain and the spinal cord only. Everything else is peripheral. Brain and spinal cord are the central nervous system. They are making these higher order executive decisions, remembering things, processing information. And in order to do so, they need a lot of help by different types of neuroglial cells. Ependymal cells are the first type of kind of helper cells within the central nervous system. Um, these are modified epithelial cells that line fluid filled passageways within the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and so here is a cross section through the spinal cord, which we're going to look at in a lot more detail here soon. Um, but in the middle, of the spinal cord is actually a tube, right? And this tube is lined with ependymal cells, lined by this very highly modified epithelial tissue, which are called ependymal cells, right? This uh, hole here is called the central canal. And again, we're going to get into that more detail here soon. <clears throat> within this tube or within the central canal is a fluid called the cerebrospinal fluid. Right? That is, this fluid circulates within the cerebro, right, within our brain itself, as well as the spinal cord. And so we call this CSF. Um, we don't have, um, you know, freely exchangeable blood circulation within our central nervous system. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And so the way that we actually distribute a lot of substances to our spinal cord and our brain is via the cerebrospinal fluid, right? So we actually use both blood in a certain way, as well as CSF to fuel our neurons and to fuel all these other cells. Okay, so um, CSF bathes over or, or bathes um, the inside of the spinal cord within the central canal. And it actually, no idea why it's doing this today. Um, and it bathes over the top of our brain and spinal cord as well. Um, the ependymal cells, um, if you look really closely, have these little cilia on them. And so the way that we get the CSF to circulate without the use of something like the heart is with these little cilia, they create a current and they're pushing it along and over the top and then recycling it. All right, so no heart is pumping the CSF. The ependymal cells are pushing it along with their little cilia. Okay. Microglia. Um, microglia are, um, they, they originated as um, a type of white blood cell. So they're actually kind of part of our immune system, um, but they've been living within our CNS or yeah, our central nervous system since before we were born. Um, essentially, they are mobile phagocytic cells. So if you remember, um, phagocytosis is essentially like cells eating, kind of like Pac-Man. Um, and so these little like brushy looking things are microglia. And so they're just gonna kind of wiggle around between all of these different cells in the central nervous system, kind of vacuuming up anything that doesn't look quite right, any cellular debris, any waste products, any pathogens that might have gotten over the blood brain barrier and into the CNS. Um, something else I want to point out here, um, 
when we look at this cross section of the spinal cord, we see that there is this funny like butterfly looking thing in the middle surrounded by white. The region that we have zoomed in on in these little images, right, to look at the ependymal cells, to look at the microglia, it is called gray matter. And the reason it's called gray matter is because it actually looks gray to the naked eye. Okay, um, and so why is it gray as opposed to white? Well, this is the region where we can see axon terminals are synapsing with dendrites and cell bodies of other neurons. And so there are very few, if any, myelin sheaths in this area. This is where neurons communicate between each other as opposed to, as we're going to see, the white matter, which looks white to the naked eye because of all of those myelin sheaths, right? So fat is white in color. And so when we wrap our axons with all of this fatty stuff within um, these insulating cells, it literally looks white to the naked eye. Okay, so um, again, the region of the central nervous system that we have zoomed in on right here is gray matter. Okay. Another type of neuroglial cell is the astrocyte. Um, astro means stars, cell, or site means cell. Um, and so these are little star cells. Um, and essentially these guys, they just do it all. We should be very grateful for our astrocytes. Um, as we can see here, astrocytes have these little like feet and their feet kind of connect to each other, creating this very selectively permeable barrier between the blood. So here's a capillary, our blood is in here and the rest of the central nervous system. And so it is the astrocytes that actually maintain what is called the blood brain barrier. All right. So very, very few things can actually cross over this blood brain barrier. Um, anything that does happen to cross over can produce serious damage to our CNS. Um, I read an article a couple of weeks ago that showed how um, as we get older, this blood brain barrier starts to leak a little bit more because everything kind of starts breaking down as we get older. Um, and even just proteins from um, albumin, right, which is the most common protein in our blood, um, you know, these benign proteins that we absolutely need to survive, if they leak across this blood brain barrier, it can lead to the degradation of your uh, nervous tissue and lead to things like Alzheimer's. Um, and so, you know, even benign stuff, not even talking about chemicals and, you know, all the other things that the blood brain barrier absolutely needs to keep out, but the good stuff, if it's not supposed to be in our brain can also lead to a lot of damage. Okay. So take a message here. The astrocytes are, um, responsible for creating the blood brain barrier. Uh, the astrocytes also provide structural support. Okay, so uh, different, uh, you know, we, we can see them kind of securing the capillary and securing this axon over here in place. So they're just kind of stabilizing um, all of the different cells within the CNS. Um, just like the satellite cells in the periphery, so your arms and legs, everything else, the astrocytes are going to maintain the extracellular environment of the CNS. Um, also, um, we know that it's really important to take things like acetylcholine out of the synapse and recycle it back up into the neurons. In the CNS, there are so many different types of neurotransmitters that are being released all the time in order to have a functional control center that the neurons themselves just can't keep up. And so the astrocytes can help to kind of suck out any extra neurotransmitters so that we're not overstimulating our cells. Okay. Um, and if there is damage in your central nervous system, um, which of course does happen, for example, if you get a concussion or something, your neurons can be um, kinked and they can break. And obviously, action potentials cannot travel down a broken axon. And so the astrocytes are actually responsible for kind of patching together those broken axons, those broken neurons, um, and essentially giving them the stability to heal those cells. Um, and so that's actually what um, this is showing us down here. Um, the astrocytes are kind of stabilizing the synapses and they're stabilizing this broken axon down here.
Okay, so astrocytes really do it all. We should be very grateful for their, uh, their help. Um, final type of neuroglial cell within the central nervous system are oligodendrocytes. All right, there's a word to impress your friends with. Um, oligodendrocytes are essentially the, the central nervous system equivalent of Schwann cells. I swear, I'm not touching anything. Crazy. Um, oligodendrocytes are different than Schwann cells in that um, here we can see one. Instead of just wrapping around a single axon, these oligodendrocytes are wrapping around multiple axons. All right, so here we can see one little branch that is myelinating an axon, and here's another little branch all on the same cell. Okay, um, so uh, it is these cells that actually give rise to the white matter of the central nervous system. Okay, um, so this entire region out here, right, surrounding this little gray matter butterfly looks white to the naked eye because of the high abundance of myelin sheaths, which again are made up of oligodendrocytes. Okay, so that's an important distinction. Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system, oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. Questions? All right. Um, summary of all of them. Astrocytes kind of do it all, right? Blood brain barrier, stabilization, etc. Microglial cells are like the little vacuums, they're part of our immune system um, that resides for pretty much our entire life within our brain and spinal cord. Ependymal cells have these little cilia and they produce and circulate the cerebrospinal fluid within the brain and spinal cord and around it. Oligodendrocytes are the myelin sheaths within the CNS. Schwann cells are the uh, myelin sheaths within the peripheral nervous system. And finally, the satellite cells kind of maintain the extracellular environment within the periphery. And all of those are important to know. And I can say that you should be able to recognize these cells without the labels, right? So if you're making a study guide, maybe you could, you know, copy this image and white out all of these um, different terms here and then try to label them and think about what they do and why they're important, right? Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Okay, so that's the tissue, right? The nervous tissue, right? of course, contains the neurons but also all of these other neuroglial cells. Together, they give rise to the function of the nervous system itself. Um, now, we are going to talk about um, the brain's organization at the very, very end of this class. Today, I want to talk about the structures of the peripheral nervous system and the spinal cord itself. And so in the peripheral nervous system, the main structures that are included, that are actually kind of um, nestled in between your muscles and fascia and everything, these are called nerves. Right? Nerves have a very particular organization um, that should actually seem kind of familiar um, if you have watched and remembered um, muscle physiology. Right? So in the very beginning of talking about muscle physiology, I talked about the organization of muscles should feel pretty similar to this. So um, this here is a nerve. Okay. The nerve itself um, is surrounded by a layer of connective tissue called the epi on top of neurium, N-E-U-R, something to do with neurons, nerves, nervous system, right? Um, so this connective tissue layer is surrounding the entire nerve, keeping it all bundled together, and that is called the epineurium. Now the nerve itself is made up of bundles of cells. Now each of these bundles is called a fascicle, and so one of these little bundles here has been kind of pulled out of the nerve, okay? The fascicle is held together, so this bundle of neurons is held together by a membrane called the perineurium, Right, peri around the perimeter, neurium, right, ner nervous system, something. Um, and of course, the bundle contains lots of individual neurons. Right, neurons, of course, are oftentimes myelinated. This is a peripheral nerve, so it is myelinated by Schwann cells. And each of those neurons are surrounded by an endoneurium, endo, all the way on the inside of this nerve. Okay, if we look closely, we can see that there are blood vessels, 
right? We can see a lot of extra tissue here. This can be connective tissue, and this can be a lot of those extra cells, um, neuroglia, right? Schwann cells, astrocytes, um, sorry, Schwann cells, satellite cells to help the nervous system. Okay, uh, so remember that a muscle is organized in largely the same way. The muscle itself is surrounded by an epimysium, right? M-Y-S is muscle, right? Each fascicle within the muscle is surrounded by a paramysium, right? And each individual muscle cell or myofiber or myocyte, whatever term you want to use, is surrounded by an endomysium, right? So the same nested structure over and over and over again. Okay. Um, so this is the organization of uh, the peripheral nerves. Our central nervous system, of course, is our body's control center. It literally needs to function perfectly in order to control everything else. And so we not only have these, you know, skinny little epiperiendoneurium structures, the central nervous system has a series of additional membranes, additional protective structures. Um, so what we can see here, just for some perspective, is a vertebra, and we'll talk a lot more about them today as well. This is essentially pointing backwards, right? This is pointing forwards. And within your spine, which is a lot of vertebrae all put together, is the spinal cord. And the spinal cord is part of your central nervous system. It has control over a lot of structures. And as we can see, the spinal cord is surrounded by these membranes, which are collectively called the meninges. Right? And of course, we protect them with lots of squishy padding and bone to really protect this very squishy structure. Okay, so a little bit more about the meninges. Um, the meninges um, are membranes that provide shock absorption and stability. Um, again, all of it is surrounded by bone. Right, Our entire central nervous system is surrounded by our skull, and our spine. If we go from superficial to deep, right, we have three different meninges. On the outside, right, which is this little white line right here, is called the dura, right? It's super durable, right? Um, it is fibrous connective tissue that is dense, irregular connective tissue, very, very strong. Um, and this has been said a lot of different ways um, that I've heard. Um, I learned it as dura mater. You might have heard it as mater, matter, whatever works for you, as long as you spell it right. Dura mater, dura mater, um, is all the way around the outside. The next layer deep is this here in green. That is the arachnoid mater. And so you might hear arachnoid and think spiders. What is that all about? Well, if you look just deep to this second little white layer here, we can see lots of like filaments. Um, these filaments kind of look like spider legs. And so that is why this membrane is called the arachnoid spider membrane. Um, now this blue space is maintained by those little spider legs, right, those arachnoid filaments. Um, and what is within that blue space is the central nervous, or excuse me, is the cerebrospinal fluid, the CSF, okay? So CSF is being circulated within the central canal here, as well as over the surface of the spinal cord and the brain, we're getting there. Okay. Finally, the innermost uh, layer of these three meninges is the pia or pia, matter or mater, whatever works for you. Um, this membrane is actually touching the surface of the spinal cord, right? So it's actually physically connected. If you were to dissect the spinal cord out, um, this would be fused with the surface of that nervous tissue. Okay, and so this has a lot of collagen, a lot of elastic fibers, really giving strength to this um, very, well, squishy, not very structurally strong um, nervous tissue. Okay, um, and of course the entire thing Right? The spinal cord, the pia, the arachnoid, the dura, the whole structure here is surrounded by a lot of fat, a lot of adipose and areolar tissue. Um, and so this is essentially, um, you know, providing a lot of padding um, and protection because, you know, you're doing jumping jacks, you fall down, whatever, you don't want to damage your spinal cord. Okay? The space between the meninges and 
the bone is called the epidural space, right? Epi meaning on top of, dural on top of the dura mater. Okay. And so we've probably all heard of epidural before, probably not as this fat filled space between your spinal cord and your vertebra, but instead as an epidural injection. All right. And so this here um, is showing um, how an epidural injection is actually administered. Um, this is a sagittal section. Right, so down the middle, sagittal section through the spine. This is facing your um, your pelvis. This here is facing your back. Right. Um, these are two adjacent vertebrae, L4 and L5. And so here we can see that this needle is injected in between the two vertebrae and into the epidural space. Thus, it's called an epidural. Um, here um, we can see. Um, the end of the spinal cord, um, which is actually called, uh, oh my goodness, uh, so <laughs> it's it's actually, um, it's called the cauda equina, made up of a bunch of spinal nerves. We are getting there today as well. Um, but essentially the trick is that you inject this cocktail of medications um, to essentially numb these nerves or stop the transmission of signals down to the nerves or up. Um, to the brain, so you can't feel anything, you can't move anything, right? But then, of course, can't go too far because um, actually uh, puncturing these neurons would be very detrimental to the patient. Right? So that is an epidural. It is an injection into the epidural space. Um, another term that you might have heard that is relevant right now is meningitis, right? Meningitis is itis inflammation of what? Of the meninges, right? And so what exactly happens here? Well, there's a lot of different types of infections that can lead to meningitis. The most common is bacterial meningitis, and this is where the streptococcus bacteria, so strep throat um, and its relatives, infect somewhere else in the body, right? So here we can see a baby. Um, it's gotten a strep infection somewhere, um, and essentially, uh, these pathogens are taken to the central nervous system, central nervous system via your lymphatic system, right? so little lymph vessels. Um, and um, if they are taken um, or if they come into contact with the meninges, they can infect the meninges and lead to a lot of inflammation. This is your immune system trying to fight the pathogens, trying to do everything it can, throw every bit of its arsenal at this dangerous bacteria. But in the process, the inflammation, which is a completely normal and helpful part of your immune system, the inflammation is detrimental to the patient because of the close proximity to the central nervous system. Any um, swelling of those meninges right here, um, you know, th th there's really not much room in this canal. And so, in, you know, we can't swell out towards the bones, the bones are not going to give. And so all of the swelling essentially is pushing down um, on the spinal cord, on the brain. Um, and this essentially stops the transmission of action potentials. And of course it can be very painful um, and it can be lethal if not addressed. Um, so bacterial is the most common type of meningitis, but there are um, some other types as well. Um, amoebic, um, you might hear about the brain eating amoeba, um, particularly in warmer climates. So if you go swimming in Florida or uh, South Carolina or something, um, sometimes there are these microorganisms that um, lead to meningitis and can, you know, in many cases be lethal as well. Um, so meningitis, general term for inflammation of the meninges. Okay. Uh, so this is, um, you know, that same image, but I want to walk through it a little bit more. This is a vertebra we're getting there today. Here are some peripheral nerves. So these are actually taking information from the central nervous system, from this executive decision center out to the rest of the body. Okay. This is facing backwards, right? So um, your back, your dorsal side. Within the vertebra is the spinal cord surrounded by the dura mater. Next, the arachnoid. The central or cerebrospinal fluid would be found right in here. And then finally, the pile or pia mater is um, 
kind of fused to the surface of the spinal cord. The spinal cord itself is made up of white matter, right? So lots of oligodendrocytes myelinating the axons, right? The multipolar neurons, axons of the central nervous system. Um, and within the white matter is the gray matter, right? It's kind of this little butterfly shape here. The gray matter is where neurons are talking to each other. They are releasing neurotransmitters into the synapses to essentially relay the message that they have received from the body or that they are sending out to the body. Okay. Uh, so that organization is really important. Um, and so if we zoom out to look at the entire body, right, or the entire nervous system, um, there is a general pattern of how information flows. And so you should definitely keep this in mind as we go through um, taking information from the periphery to the central and from the central back out to the periphery. So this is the overall organization of information flow in our body. And so we start with sensing something, right? So we, um, we use peripheral neurons to detect things like where our body is, right? We touch things, right? We feel the soft kitten. We, you know, run our hands against, you know, the rough surface of something, whatever. Um, so touch, pain, pressure, like all of these different sensations are being detected in the periphery, right? In the peripheral nervous system out here in your hands and your feet, wherever. Um, we also have some special sensory information. So our sight, our smell, our taste, et cetera, we are getting there at the end of the term. And also we are taking in information from our internal organs, right? So all around in here within our torso, that is an AMP2 concept. But in general, we're taking in all sorts of different details, thousands of bits of information every single second is being sensed in our body, around our body, within our peripheral nervous system. Ultimately, all of this different information is going to be sent along axons, ultimately to the central nervous system. The central nervous system is here in white. Okay. Uh, so the central nervous system actually processes this information, right? It's doing so with those multipolar neurons, taking in lots and lots of bits of information, all of those different dendrites, consolidating it and either sending an action potential or not. Okay, so the central nervous system is processing all of this information and at the same time, kind of like filtering out all the stuff that we don't need, right? Only focusing on the stuff that is most important. Um, keep in mind that the entire central nervous system, right? Not only your brain, but your spinal cord also can actually make decisions about how we're going to respond to all of this sensation. Okay, so ultimately central nervous system gets a lot of details. It's, it decides I'm going to respond in this way, right? My left hand just felt really hot all of a sudden. I should probably remove my hand from that particular um, surface, right? Um, and so it is then going to generate some kind of a motor command, right? This muscle needs to contract, so I move my body away from the threat, for example. So some kind of response to all of this sensory information. And that response, that decision, that command is going to be sent out via peripheral nervous system the peripheral nervous system, right? So the brain decides what's going to happen, sends the message down to the appropriate region. That message is going to exit the central nervous system, there is, that is the spinal cord, and then command some kind of a response in an effector tissue out in that appropriate area. And now the peripheral nervous system um, includes kind of two different main divisions. In AMP1, we focus on the somatic nervous system, right? And that's pretty much just controlling your skin and your muscles and, you know, all of these things that you can actually, you know, think about, right? So it's moving your skeletal muscles. I think, huh, I want to move my arm and lo and behold, my arm moves. Um, the other division is again, something we're going to talk about in AMP2, um, and that is the autonomic nervous system. And this is more automatic. We can't really modify it too much, um, but essentially the autonomic nervous system carries decision, decisions to our heart, right? To our internal organs, right? To our adipose tissue glands, all of these things that are happening completely in the background outside of our conscious control. So again, we take in information from the periphery, we send it to the central nervous system, Brain and spinal cord decides how to respond, sends a motor decision out 
we are focusing on to our skeletal muscles. Right? We think we want to move and lo and behold, we move. Okay. Different way of looking at this. Okay. We are sensing stuff happening in our skin. Right. We send the message along a sensory neuron. Right? We have about 10 million of these sensory neurons within our body. Um, we can also call sensory neurons afferent neurons. Okay. Um, and afferent, I know that's not how you normally say that word, but I want to emphasize afferent because motor neurons are called efferent neurons. Okay. So afferent is taking information from somewhere else in the body, right? From the heart, from the skin, wherever, taking it into the central nervous system. In the central nervous system, there's going to be some processing by neurons called interneurons. And we can see here that there are about 20 billion interneurons in our body, right? So, so many of these neurons, these are what maintain our memories. These are what, um, you know, can actually consolidate information and respond accordingly, right? So the neurons that are housed within your brain and spinal cord are called interneurons. Okay. Um, and finally, these interneurons are collectively going to come up with a response. That response, that decision is sent out along motor neurons. So here we can see a motor neuron, action potential traveling down it to a skeletal muscle. The skeletal muscle will be triggered to contract and move the body however our brain or spinal cord has decided. Okay. Um, if we look here, uh, what we can see is this poor guy just stepped on a broken bottle ouch, right? A sensory neuron here in blue, it's a dendrites, felt this pain, right? It detected pain. So an action potential was generated. The action potential traveled along this blue neuron, okay? A sensory neuron, an afferent neuron, is taking information to the, the central nervous system, A, that information is relayed to interneurons here in green, right? And the interneurons are going to essentially inform the motor neurons to carry information away, e exiting away from the central nervous system down to effector tissues, which are skeletal muscles, right? In both legs, in fact, to move the leg away from that painful stimulus. Okay. Sometimes the decision is made immediately within the spinal cord. Sometimes this information actually has to be taken all the way up to the brain, right? And then the brain can decide how to respond. Okay. So take home message here is that sensory neurons are detecting stimuli, taking this information A to the central nervous system, Interneurons are the multipolar neurons in the central nervous system making the decisions. And they relay this decision to the motor neurons, which take messages, the action potentials, to the effector tissues, right? So efferent, exiting, information is exiting from the central nervous system. Okay, um, effector tissues are not all created the same, right? Sometimes the um, effector tissue um, can be another neuron. Um, the one that we're going to talk about the most is skeletal muscles, right? So we looked at the neuromuscular junction and we talked about how the neurons are actually commanding the skeletal muscle to contract, right? So they excite the skeletal muscle, they couple the actin and myosin together, and then finally the sarcomeres are going to shorten, okay? So that message is relayed to this effector tissue from an action potential in the neuron. Okay, and finally, something we'll talk about um, next semester is glands can also be controlled by neurons as well. Okay. Questions? Um, so um, in the periphery, our spinal nerves contain both sensory or afferent neurons and motor efferent neurons. 
Okay. And just, just like we saw before these neurons or these spinal nerves are bundled all together. Okay. And you know, they contain neurons going to and from the CNS. Okay. Um, the spinal nerves are here. So all of these major nerves, which you're going to learn all about very soon, um, these spinal nerves each are named according to where they exit the spinal cord. Okay. So here we can see the spine, right? This is facing the belly. This is facing your back. The spinal cord is housed within the spine, right? protected by fat meninges and bone. And here we can see that their spinal nerves exit from the spinal cord between the two vertebrae, right? We actually name them according to either this vertebra or that vertebra we're getting there. Okay. All right. So the spinal nerves are part of the periphery. The spinal cord is the central nervous system. Okay. So let's break this down, looking at the organization of the spinal cord and its relationship to the spinal nerves just a little bit more. Okay. What we can see here is a very simplified diagram of the spinal cord. Here's the central canal. Right, that's lined with the pendimal cells containing cerebrospinal fluid. The meninges would be around the outside here. I have showed you, shown you that this little butterfly shape in the middle is called gray matter. It is surrounded by white matter. White matter has all of those oligodendrocytes, myelin sheaths. Gray matter contains the synapses. Right? So no myelin, just the synapses communicating between the neurons. Okay. Branching out, we can see that there are these structures coming out of actually both sides of the spinal cord. Okay. This side of the spinal cord is dorsal. All right. So this little branch here is called the dorsal root. And all of these terms are really important for lecture and lab. Right. Make sure that you take note of these. All right. So this is the dorsal side, it's facing behind you. This is called the dorsal root. That is this little branch right here. Facing the belly, right? The ventral side is called the ventral root. Okay. Note that the dorsal root only contains these blue sensory or afferent fibers. These sensory fibers are unipolar neurons, okay, bringing in different information from our skin, our muscles, et cetera. And all of these sensory neurons are unipolar and they consolidate, they group together their soma, their neuro, neurons, cell bodies, all together in this little bulbous structure right outside the spinal cord. Okay, so this little bump here is called a dorsal root ganglion. Okay, a ganglion, is a group of neuron cell bodies. Okay, so here, this is a group of neuron cell bodies, the somas of the sensory neurons within the dorsal root. Okay, lots and lots of different structures, I know. Okay, um, so here are sensory or afferent neurons grouped together in the ganglion. Okay, and so the way that I actually know that this is the dorsal side and this is the ventral side is because only the dorsal neurons, the sensory neurons, the incoming information has this ganglion, this bump. Okay. The ventral root, on the other hand, carries only motor fibers. So all of these are efferent. They are taking a motor decision out to the rest of the body, to the effector tissue, right? the skeletal muscle in our examples. Okay. The spinal nerve, on the other hand, contains both. That is, it contains both sensory neurons and motor neurons together. Okay. So ultimately, sensory information is coming in to the spinal cord via the dorsal root, right? The axon terminal, synaptic terminal, um, is going to release neurotransmitters onto an interneuron. I know some, some of these interneurons are going to carry information all the way up to the brain. Some of them, and that's what we're going to look at here in just a moment, are going, are kind of like pre-programmed to have a very particular response or initiate a very particular response um, via 
a motor fiber. Okay, so again, sensory information enters the spinal cord via the dorsal root, only the dorsal root. Sensory neuron synapse with an interneuron in this gray matter, right? That is where um, synapses are taking place. The interneuron is going to relay this sensory information to the appropriate place. In this case, it relays this information to a motor fiber, which is going to exit out the ventral root and carry a message to some pre-programmed skeletal muscle. Okay. Spinal nerves contain both dorsal root only sensory, ventral root only motor. And so that is actually what this little uh, mnemonic is doing here. Um, Dave. Dorsal is afferent, right? Dorsal roots are only carrying the afferent neurons. The ventral root, root right, is only carrying the efferent neurons, right? Thus, Dave, if you forget. Um, so questions about this type of content, um, you know, I could give you a diagram like this and ask you what is this and what type of neuron is within it, um, but also, um, kind of a classic application question is saying, you know, for example, there was an injury and this was broken, right? It was severed, no longer is the ventral root intact. So what symptoms would you experience, right? And so essentially you could take sensory information into your spinal cord. You could feel what's going on, but at this particular level, you could not control right, motor commands, anything in that particular region because of the damage here. Right? On the other hand, if you damage the dorsal root, you can control your muscles in that particular area, but you can't feel anything in that particular area, right? Because the sensory fibers have been damaged and action potentials cannot get past this injury. Questions? A little bit prettier way of looking at this. Right, again, this is the spinal cord. Gray matter in the middle, central canal. We see this bulbous structure here. Therefore, this entire side must be the dorsal side. This must be the ventral side. Dorsal root carries afferent information in. Ventral root carries efferent information in. Now, in this gray matter structure here, are, this is where the integration takes place. This is where the synapses are. Um, even though it looks like just a bunch of like gray nothing, um, this is actually highly organized. That is the synapses between sensory neurons and interneurons are taking place right here for your somatic structures, right? That is your skin, your muscles, etc. Your viscera, right, your heart, your lungs, etc., have synapses here, right, more towards the middle, okay. Um, the synapses of interneurons and motor neurons for your somatic structures, right, your muscles, etc., is happening way over here, okay, and therefore taking active potentials out, okay. Now, again, this just looks like a bunch of you know gray butterfly, but of course there's a lot more organization um, than you might expect. Um, and so we name these different regions of the gray matter as horns, okay? So on the dorsal or posterior side, and we know it's dorsal because of this little bump right here, this dorsal root ganglion, we call this the posterior or dorsal horn, right? Just this little pointy part of the gray matter butterfly. The anterior horn is on the anterior or ventral side, right? And it contains um, the synapses between interneurons and the motor neurons. Um, in the middle here, between the posterior dorsal and the anterior ventral, is another little bump. And this varies quite a lot as we're going to see. Um, 
this is called the lateral horn, right? And the lateral horn is not really prominent in the entire spinal cord. We're going to look at that in a little bit. Okay, so that is the organization for the gray matter. The white matter is essentially carrying information lightning fast up to the brain and lightning fast down away from the brain. Okay, so again, even though it looks like just, you know, white nothing, this is a series of myelinated axons that are bundled together based on what type of information is traveling and where in the brain it's going. Um, and so something you're going to learn about in the very end of class is that we have these columns of myelinated axons that essentially are like coming out of the screen towards you and back into the screen towards you, right, going to and from the brain. Um, white matter is very much organized just like the gray matter, but for now we are focusing on controlling the periphery. And so we're only going to be looking at and learning about the horns of the gray matter, right? All of these other structures of the white matter to be continued. We'll talk about them with the brain. Okay. So um, most information that is coming into your central nervous system from the periphery, right, via the dorsal roots, is going to be relayed up to the brain via one of these different tracts. There are circumstances, however, that require a little bit of a faster decision, right? Yes, myelinated axons carry information lightning fast, but it still does take time to get the decision all the way up to your brain, think about it, and then a motor command all the way back down. In a dire emergency, we want to be, we want to make a decision as quickly as we possibly can. We don't want to stop and ask our brain for permission, right? Like if we have our hand on the stove, we don't want to be like, huh, should I move my hand out of the flames? No, you just want to move your hand as quickly as you possibly can because that will limit the damage to your hand right? Safe bet, remove your hand and then think about it later. Similarly, if you trip, right? So you're walking along and you trip on a rock or something. You don't want to stop and ask your brain, huh, should I put my leg out in front of me and, you know, prevent me from falling on my face? Or should I think about it, follow my face <laughs> and then, you know, go back and ask questions later? No, certain circumstances, um, have a pre-programmed response so that you can minimize damage to your body. Okay. And so those are called reflexes, as you might imagine. Um, so reflexes involve a receptor, right? In this case, um, if you, for example, tap what is called your patellar ligament, right? Or sometimes called your patellar tendon, um, if you tap this ligament, so stretch it out, that essentially stretches your quad and the receptors within your quad um, are going to detect this additional movement that wasn't really supposed to happen, right? And so they are going to send an action potential via the afferent neuron through the spinal nerve, through the dorsal root into your spinal cord, okay? Now, usually if your quad stretches out really quickly and you weren't expecting that to happen, it means you just tripped. And so what you wanna do is you want to kick your leg out in front of you to catch yourself before you fall on your face. So instead of sending this information up one of these white matter tracts to the brain and saying, huh, should I save myself or not? Instead, this information is pre-programmed in. When your quad stretches too much, either because you tripped on something or because the doctor is hammering on your poor patellar tendon. The sensory neurons talk to interneurons, which immediately send a motor response out via the ventral root down these motor neurons and to your calf or sorry, your thigh muscles, right? And essentially this triggers your muscles to kick your leg out, which of course catches yourself all right, next time you trip, think about, you know, what happened, right? My right foot caught on a rock and immediately my right foot kicked out and caught me from falling on my face. Similarly, you tap on this, you trigger the same exact response. Stretch here immediately produces 
a kicking out of your lower leg. Okay. Um, now, this is called a monosynaptic reflex. Some reflexes are a little bit more complicated. So some of them, um, you know, involve, you know, different sides of your spinal cord, uh, different sides of um, your body, etc. But this one, super straightforward. You trip, you immediately kick your leg out. This involves literally three neurons, right? Sensory information in, interneuron, immediate response back out, right? Of course, your brain is ultimately informed, right? You know that you caught yourself. You know you had this reflexive knee-jerk response, but not until after it's already happened, right? So reflexes utilize these pre-programmed circuits to essentially save you from damaging your body. They do not stop and ask the brain for permission, right? Do not stop and go, do not collect $200. You immediately do these things and then your brain is informed. So this happens exclusively at the spinal cord or brainstem level, we'll get there later. Um, does not ask the brain, happens immediately, pre-programmed circuit. Now, of course, you go to the doctor uh, or you're an EMT or something and you are testing a lot of different reflexes. Um, essentially each reflex test, right? The knee jerk response, the pupil response, do they dilate or not? Um, or do they constrict or not? Um, there are some like right here in your elbow, there are some that you can, um, you know, you tap on your Achilles heel um, and your foot kind of kicks out a little bit. So lots and lots of different reflexes. Um, and essentially each of these reflex tests is testing a single circuit. Okay, so the knee jerk reflex, the one that we're all familiar with the most, I'm sure, um, is testing nerves, right? Your sensory neurons, particular spinal nerves within your lumbar region, actually. All of these different structures at that particular area of your spinal cord, so the L2 to L4 region of your spinal cord, myelination of these different neurons, et cetera, in that particular area. Now, you can't tap your patellar ligament, get a good reflex and say, okay, I am healthy. I am good to go. No. <laughs> um, what that's telling you is that this particular circuit is okay. There's no lesions. There's no, um, you know, breakdown of the myelin. You don't have a tumor or something like on one of these roots, right? So that circuit's good. L2 to L4, but you still have to test all the other ones. There are lots of different tests for many of the different uh, spinal nerves throughout your body. Um, so take home message, reflexes are using pre-programmed circuits. They do not stop and ask the brain for permission. They happen exclusively within a particular region of the spinal cord. They have evolved to protect us, right? So to protect us from burning ourselves, from tripping and falling on our face, from feeling pain and just, you know, continuing to step on that broken bottle, right? No, you want to remove your foot from the broken bottle and ask questions later. Um, and we use them clinically to assess the health of a particular circuit and the associated spinal cord region. All right. So let me, um, let, let's do a couple questions here, short and sweet. Um, looking at the question on the screen, which of these structures does not carry sensory nerve fibers? Oh, <laughs> it's a little soon. Um, you don't know what the Ramey are yet. So is it the dorsal root ganglion or is it the ventral root, I guess? Jump the gun on that one a little bit. not carry sensory. All right. So uh, the majority is correct. Great job, everybody. Um, the dorsal root ganglion is part of the dorsal root. It is only carrying... Oh, oh sorry, guys. Hold on. Dorsal root is carrying sensory information, right? The ventral root is only carrying motor information, right? So the dorsal root ganglion, 
right? This here is indeed carrying sensory nerve fibers or so it, the sensory nerve fibers are included. So dorsal, afferent or sensory, ventral is only motor. Um, and so actually this is the correct answer. I apologize for getting those backwards. Um, as we're going to learn here in a moment, um, our ramus, dorsal and ventral ramus, these are branches off of the spinal nerve. One goes around to the dorsal side, one goes all the way around to the ventral side. Okay. Um, and both of those carry both sensory and motor. Okay. The only structures of the peripheral nervous system that are only carrying sensory or motor are the roots. Okay. Sorry about that, getting that backwards there. Um, next question. What type of, sen of neuron is sensory and only found in the special sense organs. Anaxonic, unipolar neurons like number three, multipolar neurons like number two, or bipolar neurons like number one. So the special sense organs contain uni, multi, or bipolar. So this is also the least common in the body, right? Because our special senses are really only limited to our head. Okay, uh, this was on like the second slide of this, which I know was a long time ago now. Um, so actually the correct answer is D. Um, so, Bipolar neurons are number one, bipolar because there's one, two different branches off of um, the cell body. Um, these are found in the eye, they're found in the nose, they're found in their ear, right? Only special senses, these are by far the least common in the body. Again, found only in the special senses. Um, Multipolar, these are taking in lots and lots of different pieces of information and sending one single response out. So these are found in the central nervous system and they are motor neurons as well. All right, the ones that we have seen the most or that I've talked about the most because they're the easiest to draw um, are unipolar neurons. So one branch all of the cell bodies are generally grouped together in the dorsal root ganglion, and therefore these are the sensory neurons. Okay. All right, so the answer to that is bipolar. All right, and last question for now. Which of these neuroglia line the cavities within the brain and spinal cord? Satellite cells, microglial cell, satellite ependymal or microglial cells. And it's just another way of looking at them. So they're lining the cavities. They are a modified type of epithelium. They have cilia that kind of circulate the CSF. Beautiful. Great job, guys. B is absolutely the correct answer. And we can tell because here is where the CSF is. All right, so the cavity within the spinal cord, all of these little cilia here are circulating the CSF. All right, and this is a modified type of epithelium, the ependymal cells. To be thorough, um, these Little green ones here are the astrocytes. All right, these are, of course, neurons. These are microglial cells. All right, and satellite cells are not in the central nervous system. Right, they are only in the peripheral nervous system. It's that 
So at this point, we have looked at the spinal cord. Um, we've talked about the gray matter, including the three different types of horns. We've talked about the white matter, afferent dorsal root, efferent ventral root. Um, I want to point out now, however, that they're not all portions of the spinal cord are built in exactly the same way. There are actually regional variations, um, you know, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, etc., in the spinal cord structure. Okay, so the first variation I want to point out that is different depending on where you section through the spinal cord is the shape of the gray matter versus the white matter. So what we can see here is looking all the way up here in the neck, in the ribs, and the lower back. Right, cervical, thoracic, lumbar. We're going to add to those different terms here in just a moment. But if we look inside, what we can see is that in, this, in the cervical region, so way up here in the neck, there's pretty much just a dorsal or posterior and ventral anterior horn. In the thoracic and lumbar, however, we also get this extra little bump, which is the lateral horn. Right? And the reason why the lateral horn is present in the thoracic and lumbar, right? So from the neck down and not in the neck is because the spinal nerves that are exiting the spinal cord slash entering the spinal cord in the rib cage, as well as in your abdominal region, uh, these nerves are taking information from the visceral organs, the heart, the lungs, the stomach, et cetera, to the spinal cord and back. And so uh, remember uh, just a moment ago, we talked about the organization of the gray matter here. In the middle, this is where the visceral information is being relayed to and from the interneurons. And so if a region such as this here around the rib cage has a lot of visceral organs, that is the heart would be right here, the lungs would be right here, we would need a lot more space within this gray matter to accommodate those additional synapses. And so lateral horns are present in the thoracic and the lumbar, right, from the neck down, but they are not present in the neck. If we look all the way to the bottom of our spinal column, what we would see is a grouping of spinal nerves, but not the actual structure of the spinal cord. That is, we wouldn't see um, that butterfly shape. We wouldn't see the white matter versus gray matter. None of that. We would literally see a bunch of spinal nerves that are all bundled together into a structure called the cauda equina. So cauda means tail, equina means horse. So a horse's tail, right, bundle of neurons present in the lumbar and sacral region um, of your spinal column. All right, so what's happening here is that uh, for about the first four years of your life, you, your skeleton is growing at about the same rate as your spinal cord. All right, so until you're about four years old, everything is kind of growing together. However, at around this age, your spinal cord stops growing, but your body, of course, keeps on growing through puberty and beyond. And so our spinal cord is actually only about as long as our spine was when we were about four years old. To make sure that we actually get our spinal nerves to the lower extremities of our body, what our nervous system does is it actually grows those spinal nerves in the column, within the spine, to ultimately exit at the right place and then innervate the appropriate region of our body. Right. So again, our spinal cord stops in our lumbar region, the top of our lumbar region, really. And so what is present below that is simply a bunch of spinal nerves, right? which of course have to keep growing in order to exit the spine at the appropriate area to innervate the right stuff. Okay. So this is what the cauda equina would look like. Here's the end of the spinal cord. right? All of the nerves are still exiting at the appropriate place, but the nerves have to grow in order to do so. And so just this down here is spinal nerves called the cauda equina. Um, our spinal cord is broken down into 31 different segments. 
at each of these segments, we have a dorsal root, a ventral root, and then of course the spinal nerve, which includes both of those afferent and efferent neurons. Um, 31 different segments. Um, and they are all named according to essentially the location of the spine where the spinal nerve exits or where it's actually passing through. And we're going to talk about those names here in just a moment. But what I want to point out right now is that these different segments are responsible for what is called innervating. And I'm going to write that down for you. Um, innervating a particular region of our somatic structures, right? So innervating essentially means um, both sensing and controlling. Right? So sensing and controlling um, a, a region, a structure, et cetera. So in this case, spinal nerve T1, for example, so it's exiting the, sp the spine at this particular area. This is one of the 31 segments. The spinal nerve, containing sensory and motor neurons are going to control just this little strip of skin and the underlying muscle, okay? Here too, T1 is controlling just this little strip, right? C4 is controlling just this little strip around your neck, right? L1, just this little strip around your back and around your pelvis, et cetera, okay? So these different strips of skin and the underlying muscle that are innervated, that are controlled by a particular spinal nerve are called dermatomes. And these are clinically significant for a variety of regions, reasons. Uh, for example, if you do have an injury near your spinal cord and suddenly you can't feel this little strip along your arm, right? You suddenly can't feel it. We know that this is dermatome T1. And so that means that your dorsal root of spinal nerve T1 has been damaged, right? So there is a lesion, there is um, a severing of the neuron. Something has happened. And so we can pinpoint exactly where that damage has occurred. Also, um, different uh, pathogens can, um, infect your spinal cord and infect the roots that are going into your spinal cord, oftentimes we can pinpoint exactly where those infections are, take, are located by looking at the dermatomes. So for example, shingles is a variant of the herpes virus um, and it, uh, or these organisms, these entities infect particular um, roots of your spinal cord. And so uh, this manifests or it is evident by these little red uh, patches or rashes that are usually limited to individual dermatomes. So if you get um, these shingles right around in here, we could pinpoint that T9 and T10 is where the infection is located. Um, okay, so those are dermatomes. Um, looking at the spinal cord again, without all of the extra bones and et cetera, um, remember that we have dorsal roots, ventral roots, these joined together to form the spinal nerves. Now on the questions that I gave you um, a few moments ago, um, I also included dorsal and ventral ramus as options. So what exactly are these? Well, we of course need to control, innervate, skin and muscles on our back, as well as skin and muscles on the ventral side of our body. And so our spinal nerves actually bifurcate, they split into neurons that travel to the back right here, and they travel to the anterior side of your body. This particular region of the spinal cord is the thoracic region. And so the ventral ramus or ventral branch is actually traveling just inferior to each of the ribs, right? So this is traveling with a rib, this is traveling with a rib, and we can kind of see that three-dimensional structure in the diagram, okay? The dorsal roots, on the other hand, are going to innervate those posterior structures, right? So for example, the erector spinae, the multifidus muscles, all of these back muscles must be innervated, controlled, sensed by the dorsal ramus, 
Okay. Now, dorsal and ventral rami are containing both sensory and motor neurons because they are both simply branches off of the spinal nerve. Okay. So I point out to you now that roots, horns, and ramus, rami for plural, get confused all the time. Make sure that you make yourself some flashcards, flashcards to differentiate between all of these different structures. Final branches that I want to point out off of the spinal nerves are the communicating or sympathetic rami or rami. Um, here we can see a branch off of the spinal nerve here. These little branches are called communicating um, because they are literally communicating information of the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. Now, this is something we'll go into detail in an AMP2, but for now, note that there are these extra little parallel chains of ganglia, right, groups of neuron cell bodies, parallel to the spinal cord. Now, they're not contained within the spine. They're parallel to the spine, but this is how we control, um, you know, like accelerating the heart rate, accelerating our breathing rate, etc. All of those things are communicated, delivered to our visceral organs via this sympathetic chain of ganglia. Right? And the way that those neurons actually get to the sympathetic chain is via the communicating rami or communicating rami. Right? So that is these right here. Okay. Blue and underlined, these are terms that you should recognize. Um, for the lab, I give you this structure or this model right here, which happens to be my favorite model of all time. Um, yes, that's a super nerdy thing to say. No, I'm not sorry. Um, it's a cool model because here we can see the spine, we can see the three meninges, we can see the ribs, we can really see how all of these different structures fit together. So um, dorsal ramus going to the back, ventral ramus going out to the side so we can see it traveling with the ribs here. Okay, Communicating ramus is communicating with this chain of sympathetic ganglia, groups of neuron cell bodies. Um, we can also see the three meninges, dura, arachnoid, and pia, or pia. And the dorsal root is facing back. Ventral root is facing forward. We can tell that this is facing forward because here are the bodies of vertebrae. We're getting there in a moment. And the dorsal root has this extra little bump on it, which is the dorsal root ganglion. So here, the dorsal root ganglion. Okay, so I give you that just to compare the lecture and the lab um, models and diagrams. So you can hopefully make more connections between the two. The sorry, these um the ventral rami of the thoracic spine, so around your rib cage, travel to the front of your body and control the front of your body by being associated with our individual ribs. Right? So again, each ventral ramus is traveling with a rib, but only in that particular part of your body only in the thoracic. For the rest of your body, um, particularly the, the spinal nerves that are going to control your arm and the spinal nerves that are going to control your leg, instead of traveling out in these nice little parallel organized ways, instead the ventral rami or rami are going to form this interconnected network of nerves, right? So instead of going straight down to your elbow, these ventral rami are going to come together and they're going to split apart. And they're going to come together and they're going to be split apart, um, forming this network of nerves. And so this might seem um, unnecessary, but in fact, if you damage one of these nerves, information from a particular spinal nerve is distributed throughout this entire network. So you don't completely lose control of a particular part of your body just because you damage one particular spot. Okay, so you have um, kind of a lot of backup plans. This network or these networks are called a plexus. And each plexus is carrying information to each one of the limbs. Okay. There are four of them, each named according to where they are going right, or where they're coming from, right? The cervical plexus is controlling the neck, 
brachial plexus is controlling the brachial region, the upper arm. The lumbar plexus is controlling the lumbar region and it originates within the lumbar spine. And the sacral plexus is originating from the sacral nerves, right? sacral spinal nerves. Okay, so if you remember your regional terms, these terms should be no problem whatsoever. Okay, now in the thoracic only, there is no plexus, again, because each nerve runs with, an, with a rib. The word for rib or the root for rib is costal, as we're going to see again. Intercostal nerves are in between the ribs. Okay. Which leads us to talk about the axial skeleton. And so everything we've looked at so far is occurring within the spine and of course exiting from the spine to control the rest of the limbs here. Um, for unit two in this class, we are looking at part of the axis of the body, right? That is um, the axis itself contains the head, the spine and the rib cage, right? All of our limbs, everything else is attached to the axis of the body in at least one place. We focus on the spine and the rib cage. Now, and then at the very end of the semester, we're going to look at the head because of course the head is very complex. Essentially the axis of the body of course provides this attachment site for our limbs and therefore we can move around because of that stable attachment site. Also, the axial skeleton protects the central nervous system and a lot of our other internal organs, right? Our rib cage is going to, oops, um, is going to protect our heart and lungs, right? And actually keep our lungs inflated, keep them from collapsing, okay? The spine itself is made up of 24 individual vertebrae plus the sacrum and the coccyx, which each are several vertebrae that have fused to go together over the course of our development. Now the spine, these 24 vertebrae is broken into three different regions. The first region is cervical and the cervical spine contains seven vertebrae. The thoracic spine contains 12 vertebrae and the lumbar spine contains five vertebrae. Okay. Now, the way that I remember this um, is that we are normal people, maybe not us, um, certainly not me. Um, normal people have breakfast at seven in the morning. They have lunch at 12 in the afternoon and they have dinner at five in the evening. And so seven, 12 and five are the numbers of vertebrae in each of the main regions of our spine. Again, the sacral region um, used to be four or five vertebrae that were independent, and now they have all fused together. And the coccyx, the tailbone, is another two to four vertebrae that have fused together over time. Now, each of these vertebrae articulates with a superior bone and an inferior bone in a couple different places. The first place is an articulation that is a joint between the bodies, right? And so um, as we're going to see, this kind of chunky region of the vertebra is the body. It is what bears the weight of the entire organism, right? Um, and in between each of these vertebrae, the bodies of the vertebrae, we have something called an intervertebral disc, inter between vertebral, the vertebrae. Um, and these discs are essentially absorbing the shock. Um, so you jumping up and down, you are running around, whatever you're doing, um, your spine can compress and return to normal all the time. And in fact, if you, if you measure your height at the beginning of the day versus the end of the day, you actually get a teeny bit shorter over the course of the day because these discs kind of collapse a little bit, especially as you get older. And then when you sleep, the pressure is taken off of them. Or if you're hanging upside down or doing yoga upside down or whatever you're doing, they plump up again. Okay, so these are the intervertebral discs. Um, in the articulated spine, we can also see that there is a hole a gap in between two adjacent vertebrae called the intervertebral foramen. Um, 
as we're going to see in bones, there are some terms that just come up again and again and again, and learning these terms will be very helpful. Foramen or foramen is one of those terms. This means whole, right? So on a practical or even on a lecture exam, if I ask you for what is this whole called, you already have half of the answer, even if you can't remember intervertebral, right? So foramen means whole. And so intervertebral is a hole between adjacent vertebrae. Okay, only can be seen in the articulated or put together spine. Um, what we're also going to see is that vertebrae join together. They form a joint and articulation over here as well. So there are multiple points of attachment for stability within our spine. A little bit more about these intervertebral discs. Now, um, actually on many of your practical exams, um, you know, th this was a question, um, fibrocartilage, right? So one of the three different types of cartilage, type of connective tissue. Um, we've talked about hyaline cartilage, we've talked about elastic cartilage, and now we see fibrocartilage, right? So fibrocartilage um, has an extra rigid, extra enforced matrix, right? We're going to look a little bit more at um, cartilage matrices here soon, but essentially um, lots more collagen. These discs are therefore super strong, right? And of course, if they're shock absorbers from every moment of every day, they need to be really strong. Um, just like any other type of cartilage, this is a living tissue that contains uh, chondrocytes, chondro meaning cartilage, site meaning cell, that is located within a lacuna. Right. So a lacuna is this little gap. You're going to see um, in the next lesson that lacunae are these little holes, these little um, lakes inside bones and cartilage. Right. So here we can see little gaps containing cells. Now, all cartilage is relatively avascular. Okay. So it takes a long time to heal if it ever heals whenever it is damaged. Okay, so the disc itself has an outer layer of this really rigid fiber cartilage. And on the inside, it's a more fluid um, consistency. And the inner, the inner structure is called the nucleus pulposus. Okay. Now, just like the spinal cord varies from cervical to thoracic to lumbar, so too does the spine. Um, before we go into those different um, distinctions, I want to introduce you to just a generic vertebra. It happens to be a thoracic vertebra, but it's just a good example of any vertebra. All of them have certain structures in common. Um, so let me just give you the basics now, and then we'll look at the details themselves or the distinctions between the different places. All right, first, um, I want to point out that on the left, we, we are looking at a vertebra from the top. So we're looking down on it, the posterior, this is the back, this is the front. So this is what's pointing towards your heart, okay? This we're looking at from the side. So over here, this is the posterior and this here is the anterior, all right? So this structure here is pointing towards your visceral organs. Um, first and foremost, as I mentioned, the body of the vertebra is what actually bears the weight of our organism, of the body itself, right? So it's this big chunky part, right? An intervertebral disc would be up here and it would be down here. And here again is the body. Very convenient, very straightforward so far, hopefully. Um, there are a series of pieces of bone, right, that are pointing out away from the vertebra. In general, a piece of bone that projects away from the main structure of the bone is called a process, right? And so there are several processes on a vertebra. First, we have a piece of bone that is sticking out to the back. Right. So when you run your finger down your spine, right, you can feel through your skin these little bumps, right? That structure is called a spinous process. 
It literally, it is the piezo bone that is projecting backwards so that you can feel your spine. Okay. Now, out to the sides. All right. So this here and this here and this. And we can't see the other one from the other side or from this particular angle. Um, these are essentially pointing out to the left and the right. So if we were to talk about what plane those were in, we would say that's the transverse or horizontal plane. And so these little bits of bone that are sticking out in the transverse direction are called the trans transverse processes. Okay, so process, singular processes, plural. So they are sticking out to the left and the right to the lateral sides. Okay. The next pair of processes sticks straight up. Okay. So these bits of bone that are sticking straight up are going to articulate with the more superior vertebra. Okay. These processes are sticking straight down and they are going to articulate with the next vertebra, right? That would be down here. Okay. So these are pieces of bone that stick out from the main body, right? So they're a process. In this case, they are, the purpose is to articulate with another bone. So these are the articular processes. They articulate with the, in this case, more superior bone, and in this case, the more inferior bone. Okay. Articular processes. Um, on this side, we can see these are the articular processes as well. All right, next, this hole. I told you before that a hole is called a foramen. In this case, this is a hole through the, through the vertebra. So this is the vertebral foramen. To make this hole, right, it has to be surrounded on all sides by bone. And so the bit of bone, all right, that's making up this wall of the vertebral foramen is called the lamina for singular. And you simply add an E to the end of that for plural. And finally, this little riblet here of bone that's making up this portion of the vertebral foramen wall, this is called a pedicle, kind of like uh, little feet almost. Okay. So that is a generic vertebra. Right? It's important to learn all of those structures and be able to recognize how they differ on each of the different uh, in each of the different regions that we're about to go through. Okay, questions on those before I move to the next slide. All right. Um, so just to give you a little bit of um, a little bit more perspective, uh, particularly on those articular processes. Um, Note up here, this is an inferior articular process, and this is a superior articular process. And we can see that these processes are going to kind of slide along one another to allow us to flex our spine and extend our spine, right? So here we are bending forward, here we are standing up straight and the articular processes are just gliding along one another to facilitate that movement, right? Note that the bit of bone that is sticking up is called a process, but on each of these little bits of bone, on each of these processes, we have 
a smooth articular surface that is covered with hyaline cartilage. The cartilage is protecting the bone from rubbing on another bone and therefore breaking it down and developing bone, bone spurs to be continued. Um, the cartilage itself, which is always portrayed as blue, is called a facet. So this blue smooth part is an articular facet that is on the articular process. Okay, we can see here this is an articular facet on the inferior articular process. Okay. Um, one other structure I want to point out that can only be seen on the articulated spine, that is all of the vertebrae kind of joined together, um, and that is the vertebral canal. This is essentially the um, all of those vertebral foramina lined up. And this, of course, is where the spinal cord is located. Okay, so right where this arrow is. Okay. Okay, so each of these different regions contain very distinctive structures. They all have the same, you know, general transverse processes, spinous process, articular processes, body, all of those different things, but they all look a little bit different. So the cervical vertebrae, there are seven of them, have a few distinctive characteristics. First of all, their spinous process, right, the thing that's sticking straight out to the back that you can feel through your skin is bifid. That is, instead of being one straight solid structure, a lot of times, it forms a Y, right? And here we can form a Y as well. And so if you think about it, when you lift your head, these spinous processes would kind of bash into each other, right? Like when you put your head back to like catch raindrops or whatever, your spinous processes would jut up against each other. And so what these processes have done over time, they've evolved to form a Y so that when we stick our head back to catch raindrops, they, there we go, can fold over each other and not ram into each other. Okay, so the bifid spinous process is only visible or only present in a cervical vertebra. Okay, um, another thing that is unique is a hole in the transverse process. Okay, so this is called a transverse foramen. Transverse, it's in the transverse process, foramen, because it's a hole. And so what this is, is um, a, an extra protected passageway to get blood from your heart to your brain, even though our neck is just sticking out so vulnerable and the only bony protective structures are all the way in the back. Right? So yes, we send carotid arteries up to our brain here, but the carotids are so very vulnerable and out in front. So we have a backup plan. We make sure that we're getting blood to our brain by protecting the vertebral arteries, the vertebral veins in these little canals in our spine. Okay, so the rest of the body, right? the blood is very much, or these major arteries are very much protected by a lot of muscle, they're very protected by the rib cage and you know organs and whatever, not so in our neck. Our neck is very vulnerable. So we only need um, transverse foramina in this particular region, um, which leads me to clarify, um, foramen is singular, foramina is the plural version of this word, okay? Um, Let's see, other ways that the cervical vertebrae are unique. These are super tiny in comparison, right? And we'll look at them next to each other here in a bit. But essentially, um, your vertebrae have to get larger and larger and larger as you go down your spine because your vertebrae have to hold up a lot more weight the farther down your spine you go. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. So the cervical vertebrae, you said um, the transverse foramen that it only had, the, um, the cervical vertebrae only has, contains this uh, transverse foramen, like that's the only one that does? Correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, everything else, um, the blood is already protected, so we don't have to send it through the spine. Good question, yeah. Um, 
right, uh, before we look at some specific cervical vertebrae, um, I do want to point out that in the top corner here, um, these are instructions to access some helpful resources within Mastering AMP. Um, so if you go to your study area, um, lab resources, Practice Anatomy Lab has anatom anatomical models, and these particular um, models that it has are super helpful. So it actually lets you like rotate them and look at them from every angle and you hover your mouse over the vertebrae and it like shows you the answer. It shows you what the structures are. Um, so I think that's particularly helpful in an online class where you can't actually pick up the vertebra and move it yourself, but you can do it online. Okay, so that's what all of these uh, little instructions are up top. There are seven cervical vertebrae. They all have these unique features, the bifid spinous process, transverse foramina, and they're all super tiny. On top of that, there are three of those seven vertebrae that have special names. Okay. In general, we name vertebrae according to um, the region. So C for cervical. The first one closest to the head is C1, the second one is C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7. All right, so seven, all starting with C. Three of these vertebrae have additional names on top of those more generic letter number combinations. C1 is also called Atlas, right? So this is named after um, the Greek god Atlas, right? Who, he's the guy who has the whole world on his shoulders. And so in this case, Atlas, your C1 vertebra has your entire world, your head on your shoulders, All right? So Atlas holds up your head. Axis is C2, and this actually is the axis on which you can shake your head no. Okay. Here we can see Atlas and Axis put together. Top one is Atlas C1, and the bottom one we can see is modified to actually have this little pivot point, which we'll name in just a second, so that Atlas can rotate around this pivot, this axis point, and shake your head no. And finally, all the way down at the bottom is C7, vertebra prominence. Um, and so this is a very prominent vertebra. In fact, if you run your fingers down your spine, like right where your neck meets your back, you feel that one vertebra is kind of sticking out a little bit farther than the rest of them. That's your vertebra prominence. And so the reason why we care, right? It, it's not just, oh, okay, we can feel it. That's cool. Is that a lot of, um, well, physicians will use your spine as almost like a ruler, right? So they will feel down your spine and okay, the pain is here at like T3, T4. And so we can associate different parts of our spine with the organs that are in that region. So a lot of times um, in A and P2, organs are introduced as, okay, the kidneys are between, you know, T11 and L whatever, right? So we use our spine as a ruler, as a yardstick and the first reference point, kind of the top of the ruler, is C7, the vertebra prominence. Okay. Um, specifically, atlas and axis are a little bit different than any other cervical vertebra, any other vertebra in general. Atlas is different because it doesn't really have a body. Okay? It has a huge vertebral foramen. Okay, and if you think about it, your entire brain, your entire brain stem has to converge down and then ultimately your whole spinal cord has to pass through this first hole. So that's why Atlas has such a large um, vertebral foramen. Also, the foramen actually wraps around this additional structure on axis, right? And over time, over evolutionary history, the body of this vertebra fused with the body of C2. And now this little piece that's sticking up, kind of like straight out of the screen at you, this is the, this is the axis itself. And we call it dens, right? It's also called the odontoid process um, if you want to be super fancy, but generally students like dens because it's easy, right? Looking at these two vertebrae from a slightly different perspective, Atlas has a huge vertebral foramen, which wraps around the dens of axis. Again, we can see the bifid spinous process, and we can see that this vertebra can literally rotate around the dens and shake our head. No. Okay. 
Now let's connect this back to the spinal cord and the spinal nerves, right? We're looking at the region, not at individual organ systems here. We of course have seven cervical vertebrae and we have eight spinal nerves that exit the spinal cord adjacent to those seven cervical vertebrae. So one moment here, here are some cervical vertebrae, right? Or really any vertebrae. The spinal nerve exits the spinal cord, which is here in yellow, and it passes through that intervertebral foramen, that hole between the two vertebrae, okay? Just like we looked at before. So here's a spinal nerve. We name the spinal nerves according to which vertebra it's exiting the spinal cord near. The rules for naming spinal nerves. In the cervical spine, where the first seven nerves, we name the nerve according to the vertebra that is inferior to it. Okay, so here, right, this is the spinal cord, brain stem, spinal cord. Spinal nerve C1 is going to exit superior to vertebra C1. Nerve C2 exits superior to vertebra C2. C3 above C3, C4 above C4, C5, C6, C7 is above C7. But I said that there were eight cervical spinal nerves. So there is also a nerve that exits inferior to C7 for a total of eight cervical spinal nerves. So the nerve that exits underneath C7 is called C8. Now, every other nerve from T1 on down is named according to the vertebra that's above it. So we can see here, T1 nerve exits under T1 vertebra, right? Um, so down here, this would be vertebra T2 and nerve T2 would exit underneath it. Does that make sense? Sometimes that can be a little wonky. I think, I think we have a question coming up here too. Make sure we get that. Okay, so for the cervical spine, nerve is above the vertebra until we get to C8, that's the weird one. And then from T1 on down, the vertebra is above the nerve with the same name. The thoracic vertebrae also have some unique features. Um, now the thoracic vertebrae, there are 12 of them. We name them T1, T2, T3, et cetera. Um, every single thoracic vertebra articulates with a rib. And as such, there are specific structures that reflect that, okay? So a rib connects with the thoracic vertebra at the body, and on the transverse process. Here, we can see a little blue thing, right? A smooth articular surface on the body and a smooth articular surface on the transverse process. These are where the ribs are going to articulate. We call both of these a costal facet, right? Costal for rib, facet for smooth articular surface, right? And again, the rib articulates with the vertebra in both of those places, okay? So you should not see a little indentation on the body and on the transverse process anywhere else except for in the thoracic region, okay? Other unique features. The spinous process is not bifid, so it doesn't make that little Y, but it points down, right? It projects inferiorly. Um, and so if you look at the curvature of the spine on um, the thoracic curves forward a little bit so kind of like hunchback it curves this way instead of the other way um and so if these spinous processes did not point down right every time you bend down to, to tie your shoe you would essentially be like a stegosaurus right all of your vertebrae would be sticking straight up out of your back that would make wearing a backpack terribly uncomfortable you would be you know bumping these processes and you know hurting your skin your muscles all the time and so in the thoracic spine only spinous processes point down 
Other ways you can tell the difference, um, the intervertebral foramen is roughly triangular-ish, and the body is kind of sort of heart-shaped if you use your imagination. Okay. Or sorry, um, it is not that. Um, roughly heart-shaped and round here. Okay, round vertebral foramen, heart-shaped body-ish. The triangular, pardon me, is in the lumbar. Right, so the lumbar vertebrae have a roughly triangular vertebral foramen, a really, really big fat body. Right, so this has to be super large because your lumbar spine is supporting your entire torso, arms, and head. It's supporting the most weight of all. Um, let's see, the spinous process sticks straight out the back like a big hatchet. Okay. And um, the articular facets, they point medially on the top and they point completely laterally on the bottom. And so this is important because essentially um, the, thir or the lumbar vertebrae kind of slip into each other, right? So they slip into each other. Um, the superior processes are on the outside, the inferior processes are on the inside. And so what this does functionally is it allows you to like bend over, right? To tie your shoe, but you can't really do any twisting, right? It prevents any of the twisting. So all of the like oblique exercises that you do, all of that twisting stuff, um, you know, you're doing yoga or whatever, um, all of the twisting is happening in your thoracic spine, right? Because your thoracic vertebrae, their articular processes face front and back, right? So here facing posterior, right? These are facing anteriorly. And so they can slide to the left and the right. They can slide up and down full mobility in your thoracic spine, but in your lumbar spine, they are rigidly locked into place, right? They can only go like this. They can't twist at all. Also, um, final note about lumbar vertebrae, these things are huge in comparison to the others, right? Okay, so that is the 24 main independent vertebrae. All the way at the bottom of your spine, we have the sacrum. Again, the sacrum is a bunch of vertebrae fused together over the course of your own personal development. We can even see that there are still holes, which would have been the intervertebral foramina. Right, but now this is all the same thing. We can also see that there are ridges, right, which would have been, you know, where the bodies were joining together. Okay, um, on the posterior side, right, so this is the back of your sacrum or sacrum. Um, we can see what used to be the spinous processes. Now it's called the median sacral crest. Okay, note that the vertebral canal doesn't stop at the end of the lumbar spine. We still have the end of that cauda equina that has to pass through the sacrum and then out via these sacral foramina. Um, and so the sacral canal is actually continuous and it pops out way down here. So more nerves, spinal nerves would be coming out here. <clears throat> okay. um, the sacrum articulates with L5, right? So here is a superior articular process. Okay. And finally, the sacrum articulates with the coccygeal bone or the coccyx, your tailbone. Um, your coccyx is, you know, another two to four bones that are fused together, even more so, and they're more reduced than your sacral bones. Last portion of the um, axial skeleton that we're going to talk about in this part of the course. Again, we'll get to the skull at the very end. The rib cage. Okay. The rib cage um, attaches to the thoracic spine in the back and on the anterior side to the sternum. The sternum consists of three different parts. The manubrium, right? So the manubrium is, um, you know, if you kind of run your fingers along your collarbone here, 
Um, you can feel that there's this little indentation in between your two collarbones. That indentation is actually this right here. It's part of the manubrium. Um, next is the body. And finally, the xiphoid process. All right, so the xiphoid process is all the way at the end of your sternum. We can see that it's blue and not white, indicating that um, this is cartilage. Now, over the course of your life, the xiphoid process is converted into bone. And so if you are um, an archaeologist, for an example, um, you can, or one of the clues that helps you determine how old the person was when they passed away is looking at the xiphoid process, right? Seeing it, how bony it is versus how, how cartilaginous it is. Okay. Um, ribs. We have 12 pairs of ribs. Seven pairs are called true ribs. And they, they're called true ribs because each of them articulates with the sternum with its own individual cartilage. The cartilages themselves are called costal cartilages. So costal meaning rib. So here is an individual costal cartilage, another and another. And so the first seven ribs attaches to the sternum with their own individual cartilage. And so the reason why these cartilages are so long, as opposed to, you know, most other joints, the cartilage is like super skinny, um, is so that your rib cage is flexible. Every time you inhale and exhale, your ribs are actually moving. Um, they're actually being pulled up and allowed to set down by those intercostal muscles. Right? Um, so first, Seven ribs articulate with the sternum via their own costal cartilage. And then of course they articulate with the thoracic spine as well. The next or the, the rest of the ribs are called false ribs because they either attach indirectly or not at all to the sternum. All ribs articulate with the spine, only some articulate with the sternum. Um, the, uh, or so pairs eight through 10 share a cartilage. So eight, nine, oops, sorry, 10, nine, and eight. All, right, all of these are sharing this cartilage. So they are false ribs. And a subset of the false ribs are floating ribs. So if you look closely, way back here, number 12 and number 11 do not have any costal cartilage. They just kind of float around to the back and protect your kidneys. Now the ribs themselves have particular structures that you should learn for the practical and the lecture exam. Specifically, there's a little fatter portion of the rib that articulates with the body of the thoracic vertebra that's called the head. Skinny part next to the head is always called the neck, no matter what we're talking about. And then there's another little bump that articulates with the transverse process via the costal facet here. And that is called a tubercle. Another word you will see again and again. Okay. The main body of the rib is called the shaft. And so this is where the costal cartilage would be articulating with the sternum over here. Now, um, in the lab video, I try to show you guys which is the top and the bottom and the left and the right. But just to reiterate that, um, remember that the intercostal nerves, right, spinal nerves, T1 to T12, are going to travel just underneath each one of their associated vertebrae. Okay. Um, and they're going to do that in this little groove here. So the little groove is always going to be on the bottom of the rib. Right. So this is facing down. The head and the tubercle are always to the back. Right. And this little flat portion here is always to the front. And so if we know that this is the bottom and this is the back, this must therefore be a right rib. Okay, again, something that's very important for the lecture, or sorry, for the lab, but I just wanted to reiterate it in the lecture as well. Summary of the entire vertebral column. Um, cervical spine, C1 through C7, thoracic, 12 vertebrae, lumbar, five vertebrae, and then the sacrum and coccyx at the bottom. Um, I do want to point out that there are different curves to the vertebral column. So here we can see the thoracic and the pelvic curve are in the same direction. The lumbar and the cervical are in opposite, are in the opposite direction. Okay. Now the thoracic and pelvic curve 
These are both called primary curvatures. Um, and the reason for this is that when you are in the fetal position, right? So when you are feet, a fetus, um, you are curled up in this big C, right? So this is the first curvature of your spine that develops. So it is very fetal. Um, but then as soon as you start to sit up for the first time and then stand up, you develop these secondary curvatures. Um, and so essentially these are opposite to your primary curvatures to essentially balance out your spine. Um, and this allows you to stand up straight as opposed to, you know, like walking on all fours like a bear, um, you know, who can maintain that single type of curvature, right? So the opposite curves of our cervical and lumbar spine is simply allowing us to stand up straight. So this develops um, when we walk for the first time. So a couple more questions here. Um, what is present within the dorsal root ganglion giving it a swollen appearance? All right, so going back a little ways now into this presentation, what's the dorsal root ganglion? Cell bodies, is it swollen with CSF? it a lot more myelin or just layer after layer of connective tissue? Dorsal root ganglion. All right, so um, the answer is actually A. Um, so uh, remember that the dorsal, uh, the dorsal root is containing only sensory neurons. Sensory neurons are unipolar, so they're little soma, their little cell body is just like sticking off to the side of the axon. All of those little soma are bundled together into this little bump right outside the spinal cord, which is called the dorsal root ganglion. So specifically, the dorsal root ganglion is the cell bodies of sensory neurons, right? Sensory neurons also called afferent neurons. Um, remember that the CSF is housed within the central canal of the spinal cord. And also it is um, within the subarachnoid space. Okay, so that second of the three meninges, the arachnoid mater, right under that arachnoid mater is where the CSF is. All right, additional myelin, this would be found in the white matter right, of the central nervous system. And multiple layers of connective tissue, not quite. I don't think anyone chose that. Good. Um, fascicles are bundles of axons. Which layer of tissue partitions the nerves into fascicles? Right, and again, this is the same type of organization that muscles have. It's just a little bit different. Muscles, that's called epimycium, paramycium, endomycium. Here it is neurium. Okay. So remember that the entire nerve is surrounded by a layer. The little bundles of neurons are surrounded by a layer. And then each neuron is surrounded by its own layer. All right, neck and neck. <laughs> um, so a tie between A and C. Um, and I'm sorry to say that it's perineurium. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, let's write it out. The whole nerve is surrounded by a membrane called the epineurium. Okay. The Fascicles are the little bundles inside the nerve or similarly inside the muscle. Each one of them is surrounded by a perineurium. It's around the perimeter. Epi is all the way on top. Peri is around the perimeter of what? Of the fascicles, because these are fascicles. 
Um, and of course, fascicles are just individual neurons. Right, so this is a neuron, this is a neuron, this is a neuron. Right, so fascicles are just a bunch of neurons, each of them surrounded by an endo, endo all the way on the inside of the neurium of the uh, nerve. Does that make sense? Is that okay? okay. All right. And finally, which spinal nerve exits inferior to T7? Inferior to T7. I bring this up because yes, that's a little tricky. It, it sounds so simple and then you go to think about it and it's suddenly not. <laughs> Any other thoughts? No big deal if it's not right. I really just do this so that we can see where we are and get feedback on our thoughts. All right. Uh, really no consensus. <laughs> um, let's walk through it. The cervical spine, remember, for C1, the spinal nerve that exits above C1 is C1. C2, C3, four, five, six, and seven. So this is vertebra C7, okay? And nerve C7 is right above it. All right, so over the entirety of the cervical spine, we name the nerves according to what is under it. One exception, that exception is C8. All right, we can see that C8 is between the cervical and thoracic regions. Okay, everything from T1 on down is named according to what's above it. So this is vertebra T1. And so the nerve that exits under vertebra T1 is T1. So next we have T2, three, and all the way on down, four, five, six, and seven. All right, what did I say? Four, four five, six, seven. And so we want the nerve that exits inferior to T7, which would be T7. Okay. Here's the cutoff. Cervical, the nerve comes out above. Thoracic on down, the nerve comes out below. So T7 would be the right answer. Questions on that? All right. Um, any questions on that? entire everything. Okay. So transitioning into bones, right? So we just talked about um, specific bones. So the vertebrae themselves. Um, let's talk a little bit about the bone physiology now. Where we're going with this is that I just want to briefly introduce you to some, you know, larger, some gross anatomy structures of the bones. And then in your next lesson, um, which I'll show you um, as soon as I'm done here, you'll cover all of the details of that, okay? So um, bones, as we know, are a type of connective tissue. They are very similar to cartilage. We know that there are three different types of cartilage, okay? Um, we've talked about connective tissue proper, and you just had a practical exam on that. Um, fluid connective tissues you get into for next semester. Um, we're gonna skip the video, um, but I encourage you to watch it. It's a really nice summary of the bones in general, but just in the interest of time, we're going to skip over that for now. Okay, um, all of the bones, approximately 206 bones in our body um, are 
classified according to shape. The bones that we'll talk about the most are long bones because they are longer than they are wide. Okay, so most of the bones that we talk about are long bones. Short bones are um, approximately as long as they are wide. Um, so these are things like your wrist bones, your ankle bones. We have a series of flat bones like our sternum, like we just talked about. Um, also, a lot of the bones of our head are considered to be flat bones. Um, sesamoid bones um, are super rare. They are found exclusively within a tendon, so things like your patella. Okay. And finally, irregular bones, the ones that we just talked about, these ones don't have a particular shape. They're not long, they're not short, they're not you know, round, whatever. They just have very unique shapes. Okay. All bones, regardless of the structural class, have the same general pattern, the same general structure. All of the bones are covered by a membrane called the periosteum. Right, and as we go through this, you're going to hear ost, 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 ost. When in doubt, write ost, and that's partially correct. Um, in this case, a membrane surrounding the entire outside, the entire perimeter of a bone is the peri perimeter. Osteum, ost means bone. And so here we're looking at a flat bone of the skull. We see a periosteum. Here we're looking at a long bone called the femur surrounded by the periosteum. The periosteum is secured to the surface of the bone by what is called perforating fibers. So these are actually embedded within the bone and they make sure the periosteum stays on the bone. Now, a little bit deeper to that, we have a type of skeletal bone tissue called compact bone, right? So that's what you guys actually looked at when you were looking at histology slides for the last lesson, compact bone. Finally, all the way on the inside, um, kind of sandwiched in between compact bone layers, is called the spongy bone. Now, of course, there's a lot of different names. This is anatomy after all. Why name something once if you can't name it two or three times? We call it spongy bone, trabecular bone, or cancellous bone. A little more about the periosteum. Um, the entire bone is covered by the periosteum except for structures that are covered with cartilage. Now, if we look back here, we can see this light blue, which I told you blue means cartilage here. This is hyaline cartilage, it is forming part of the joint. This is also forming part of the joint. So these regions are covered with cartilage, the rest is covered with the periosteum. The periosteum itself contains two different layers. The outermost layer is fibrous, right? So it is dense, um, irregular connective tissue. And essentially this is the structure to which your tendons are going to attach. So the muscle attaches to the bone, origin and insertion by the tendon fusing with the periosteum. Okay, so the anchoring points for tendons and ligaments. Um, the perforating fibers, of course, are an extension off of this fibrous layer, and they are what secure this layer to the underlying bone. Now, deep to the fibrous layer, is something called the cellular layer. Um, so here we can see that a pair of forceps have pulled the periosteum away. The outer layer is fibrous, the inner layer is cellular. And these cells are critically important to the life of the bone, the healing of the bone, the maintenance of the bone. Um, they are called osteogenic cells. They generate any osteo cells, right? Any of the cells that make or break or maintain the bone. Okay, so two different layers. The innermost layer contains stem cells that when triggered can make bone, break bone, maintain bone, and in some cases make cartilage as well. Now the periosteum is very vascular. In fact, about a third of the bone's blood supply is delivered via this membrane. And so bone, of course, is very different from cartilage in that it has a lot of blood going to it all the time. In fact, here we can see a vein or sorry, an artery and a vein. Lots and lots of blood, very active tissue as opposed to the cartilage, which is relatively avascular. Also, we can feel our bones pretty well, right? You break a bone, you can feel it a lot, hurts a lot. And so lots of nerve fibers are traveling into the bone via the periosteum. As I said, we are going to focus the most on long bones as opposed to any of the other bones in the body. Um, at least when we look at the microanatomy, um, long bones have are, are longer than they are wide. 
and they are broken into different regions. First of all, we have the fatter regions on the proximal side and the distal side of the bone. The fatter regions are essentially making up part of the joint, right? As we can see, there is cartilage on these fatter portions of the bone as opposed to the skinny shaft portion. Um, the fatter regions at the ends of the long bone are called the epiphyses. Epiphysis, I-S for singular, E-S for plural. Epi on top of, right? So these are on top of the bone. Um, always part of an articulation or a joint. Essentially, these regions are a little bit fatter so that we can distribute the weight um, in a larger surface area to reduce, reduce the force on individual portions of the bone. And of course, to maintain that very delicate, slow to heal hyaline cartilage. Now, the cartilage itself, the tissue type is hyaline cartilage. The structure, however, is called articular cartilage. And this gets confused all the time. So I want to emphasize this is really important. Hyaline cartilage is the tissue, right? Our costal cartilage is our are hyaline cartilage, right? Like um, the facets, right? In our vertebrae, they are made of hyaline cartilage, right? So that is the tissue type. That is the fabric that makes up the structure, articular cartilage. Right? So again, a question could ask you, what is the structure articular or what is the tissue hyaline, okay? In the epiphyses, right? Just like any other part of any other bone, we have compact bone on the outside, but in the middle, right, deeper in the bone is the spongy bone. Now within the spongy bone, right, of course there are lots of spaces that make it look very spongy. Within those spaces is housed the red bone marrow. So what the red bone marrow is actually doing is it is generating all of the blood cells in our body. So mostly red blood cells, but also white blood cells and platelets originate here as well. So the red bone marrow is housed within the epiphyses of these long bones. Okay, this is where blood cells are made. The shaft of the long bone is called the diaphysis. The diaphysis is hollow. And within this hollow, what is called medullary cavity, is a different type of bone marrow. This bone marrow is called the yellow bone marrow. Um, and maybe if you um, have gotten soup bones from the grocery store before, right, to cook up for your dog or to cook up into soup for yourself, whatever, um, essentially those soup bones, right, are sections through the femur of a cow or a pig and it's bone. And then inside there's that like slimy, gooey stuff. That's the yellow bone marrow. Okay? And that yellow bone marrow is essentially fat, right? So this is fat that is um, saving energy, it is storing energy for our body. It is not, you know, the fat that you go to the gym to get rid of, right, to work off. We really need this yellow marrow to stay um, throughout our lives so that we always have this nice um, energy rich storage, uh, storage type. Okay, so yellow bone marrow is within the medullary cavity. Red bone marrow is within the spongy bone of the epiphyses. The medullary cavity is lined by a membrane that is virtually the same as the periosteum, right? It's not quite as strong because we don't have muscles attaching to it, but it's still this lining that is um, containing lots and lots of stem cells, right? So if there's ever any damage to the bone or, you know, we need more calcium, we need to break down the bone or build it up because we've been taking our vitamins, whatever, those stem cells originate from the endosteum, endo inside, and periosteum, peri, perimeter. Now, the long bone contains a couple structures that, uh, that reflect the developmental process. And so in your next lesson, um, you will hear about how the long bones form, how the flat bones form, et cetera. And so you will see these structures and how they develop. Keep those in mind. Some remnants, the epiphyseal line, right? This is an adult bone and we can tell that it's an adult bone because there are these compact bone lines within the epiphyses. These are essentially what used to be your growth plates or your epiphyseal plates, right? So your growth plates um, are cartilaginous while you're growing. We essentially make cartilage and then um, ossify it. We kind of convert it into um, bone. When triggered to, um, which again, you'll learn all about in the next uh, 
the next lesson, your epiphyseal plates close. That is the bone cells catch up to the cartilage cells and all the cartilage is replaced by bone, but it never fully blends into the rest of your bone. What we're left with for the rest of our life is a little scar that used to be your growth plates. Also, um, one of the very first steps in developing bones is a blood vessel entering into a cartilaginous model that will kind of sort of resemble a bone. Okay, that blood vessel entering into the diaphysis um, is, you know, that, that very important step is visible throughout the rest of your life because it stays there. That blood vessel never goes away, good thing. Um, and it is there then called the nutrient foramen. And so this is where most of the blood enters into the bone. Um, zooming in on some microanatomy of the bones, um, we're going to look at the compact bone first. The compact bone is of course on the more superficial surface of the bone. So it's all the way around the perimeter, all the way on the outside. Um, the structural unit of the compact bone, which of course has to be very strong. It has to be very resilient to force and stress, right? It's on the outside. It is the harder part. Um, the structural unit that is super strong is called an osteon. Again, lots and lots of ost in this lesson. An osteon is a cylinder of concentric rings of bone. You can kind of think about this like a tree, right? So the whole trunk would be the osteon and individual tree rings, individual layers that are deposited every single year in a tree or um, <laughs> concentrically over the development of your bone. Um, these layers, the tree rings, are called lamellae. Okay, so each one of these is called an osteon. The individual layers are called lamellae. Um, we can see that the compact bone itself is made up of lots and lots of tree trunk osteons squished really closely together, giving rise to the strength of these structures. Okay. Um, each osteon contains four to 20 concentric lamellae. And note that each of these lamella, right? Lamella for singular, add an E for plural, contains collagen running in opposite directions, right? And so it's very highly organized in such a way that the bone isn't just resistant to kind of compressing when you're jumping up and down doing jumping jacks, but also you're playing soccer and your bones are kind of like twisting as you are running and then stopping and changing directions. So we need our bones to be strong, not only this way, but also to a little bit of twisting. And so the opposite collagen fibers and different lamellae give rise to that resistance. All the way on the inside of the osteon is yet another canal that is called the central canal. How convenient, right? And in the central canal, we have arteries, veins, and nerves. Again, the bone is super vascular. And all the way on the inside here of the central canal, there is endosteum as well. So there are stem cells inside each and every one of these tree trunk osteons. Zooming in even farther, we can see the lamellae. And in between a lamella and the next lamella are these little holes, all right? In these little, or these little holes are called a lacuna, or add an E, lacunae, for plural, a little hole. And in these little holes are cells called osteocytes, all right? Again, os for bone, site for cell. So these are the mature bone cells that are maintaining the bone over the course, you know, of their lives. Okay. Um, in the next lesson, you will learn all about how these guys work, but essentially bone building cells, the ones that are laying down lamella after lamella are called osteoblasts. And those cells actually get trapped in the lacuna that they themselves make. And when they do, we then call them osteocytes, right? So they're going to stay in these little holes smushed in between the lamella for the rest of their cellular lives. Now, in order for this cell or this cell to get nutrients and oxygen from this blood vessel here, we don't have the cells moving, right? They're trapped in these little holes. And so in order to get fed, oxygen and nutrients has to diffuse from the blood 
to this cell, to this cell, to this cell. And the way that these cells are communicating and kind of like, um, you know, like relay race passing off these substances is through little canals, right? These little things right here called canaliculi, right? It has the word canal in it. Canaliculi, they're super tiny little canals connecting this lacuna and its osteocyte with this lacuna and its osteocyte. Okay, so again, this is how immobile cells actually get fed. Okay, another way of looking at this, right? Little wedge taken out of an osteon tree trunk. We zoom in, we can see those little tree rings, the lamellae, and osteocytes, which are connected to other osteocytes via canaliculi. And so blood components, right, oxygen, nutrients, et cetera, has to go from the central canal to one cell to the next to the next via the canaliculi. Okay. Uh, also, I want to point out. Um, the periosteum with its perforating fibers. Blood is delivered to the central canal through the periosteum and through these uh, canals here called perforating canals. They are actually connecting the central canals of each osteon and ultimately delivering blood all the way to the spongy bone inside, which as we now know, contains the red bone marrow, which is making blood cells. Few more structures. I just uh, pointed out the perforating canals, right? So they are perpendicular to the central canals and they are delivering blood to each osteon, okay? We have lamellae or these tree rings of bone, not only in the osteons, but around the perimeter of the cells, or sorry, not of the cells, of the entire bone. Um, these layers of bony tissue go around the entire circumference of the long bone. They're just inside the periosteum and we call them circumferential lamellae, right? Because they're going around the entire circumference of the bone. Um, these add additional strength in that they increase the diameter of the bone, right? Fatter bone and stronger bone. They are deposited via a process called appendicular growth or appendicular bone deposition. You'll hear about that in the next lesson as well. Okay. well. We look inside the bone, right? So surrounded by compact bone, the deeper bony tissue is called spongy bone or trabecular bone or all sorts of different things. Um, spongy bone is not actually squishy like a sponge, but it looks like it is, right? Um, the reason it looks like a sponge is because the primary structural unit of the spongy bone is called a trabecula, right? Which are these little riblets here. So it looks like a sponge, but not actually squishy. Um, it really looks like the spongy bone is super weak and how could it possibly be structural at all? But I want to point out that these trabeculae, right, these little riblets of bone in the spongy bone are actually highly organized and um, they are still pretty strong. Maybe not as strong as the compact bone, but they're pretty strong. And so I want to point out that um, when you look at larger buildings, right? So you go into the main academic spine at Stockton or you go into BJ's or Walmart or your high school gym or whatever, and you look up at the ceiling, you see all of these like little riblets, right? So this entire structure here is called a truss. And essentially these little uh, bits of angle iron are distributing the force of the roof and the snow and everything that's on top of the roof. They're distributing it in such a way that this structure, even though it's hollow, right? It's not a solid I-beam, it's hollow. The force is distributed so that it is still super strong but now it is much lighter. We are using fewer resources, right? As opposed to making that a solid ivy. And so our bones are doing the same kind of a thing. We did it first, right? We did it before your gym did it. Um, but these little rib riblets called trabeculae are distributing the weight, you know, the, the force put on our bones, all the while making the bones themselves much lighter. And of course, opening up the bones so that we can fit other things like bone marrow in them. 
Okay, so lattice, very similar to buildings that we've seen. Um, they are actually pretty organized, just like this. We can see a pattern. Our trabeculae do the same thing. These trabeculae line up along stress lines to ultimately distribute the weight for the least stress on our joints and our bones. Okay, um, the, the trabeculae are also covered with endosteum. Okay, they have lamellae within them, but these are not organized into osteons themselves. It's just kind of a bunch of layers that are organized for weight distribution. Um, as such, there is no central canal Right? There's no osteon, so there's no central canal, um, but we don't really need that in the spongy bone. Remember that all of this empty space here is filled with bone marrow. Bone marrow is making the cells, and so this is extremely vascular, even though we don't have individual vessels going through the bones. Okay, so the structural unit of the compact bone is the osteon. The structural unit of the spongy bone is a trabecula for singular, trabeculi for plural. Okay. Both long bones and flat bones and everything else contains compact bone and spongy bone. Right? We have been looking at long bones. We can see the compact bone around the outside, medullary cavity within the diaphysis, and the epiphyses are filled with spongy bone. In a flat bone, we kind of have like a sandwich of compact bone with spongy bone on the inside. Our flat bones also contain bone marrow within the spongy bone. Um, now, if you are donating bone marrow or need a bone marrow transplant, it is possible, of course, to remove bone marrow from this, um, from our spongy bone. Of course, with a, a drill, you can pass through the compact bone to get to that spongy bone. Um, even though blood cells are being made in the epiphyses of our long bones, generally, um, particularly in adults, bone marrow is taken from the hips, right? So here we can see one of the iliac bones, one of our hip bones, um, and here is a needle that is removing some bone marrow. Um, and so as adults, most of our blood cells are made in our hips, in our sternum, right? Um, and so the reason why it's almost always taken from the hips is that um, everywhere else is a little bit risky, right? So if, uh, if the doctor makes a mistake and the needle slips like around your sternum, your heart and your lungs are there, we can puncture one of them and that's really bad. Um, but around your hips, there's a lot of extra muscle, nothing too life-threatening is in that area. So generally, um, bone marrow is taken from there. Okay. Um, final couple structures, and then I will finish up today. Um, the end of a long bone is called what? And what structure is covering it? Right? So this little bracket here, what is the whole end of the long bone called? And what is this blue thing covering it? All right, good guys. Uh, remember that the root for end or on top of is epi. And congratulations, the majority is absolutely correct. Great job, guys. Um, so epi. Epiphysis, epi is on top of. So this is on top of the humerus and this is you know, on the other end of the humerus, right? So proximal and distal sides. Um, what is covering this? Well, it is the articular cartilage. Remember that the articular cartilage is the structure and the hyaline cartilage is the tissue type, right? This is the medullary cavity. This is the periosteum. This entire shaft of the long bone is the diaphysis, okay, and the tissue type is hyaline cartilage. Okay. 
what is true about this structure, which I just told you what it is. <laughs> Do you remember? I think we can automatically eliminate two of these, <laughs> two of these uh, answers. Right. Is it the endosteum, the dermis, or the periosteum? And is it made of just dense regular connective tissue, or is it made of this fibrous connective tissue and stem cells? All right. Great job, guys. The majority is correct. All right. So again, this is the periosteum. It is literally going around the perimeter, peri, of the ost bone. Two different layers within the periosteum. One is super strong, fibrous connective tissue for the attachment of muscles and ligaments. The other is stem cells. And right? the stem cells are going to make and break the bone right? in a good way. Okay. All right, now I'll just tell you this one, this structure here is the epiphyseal line. So that's the scar left over from the closure of your growth plates. All right, any questions? <laughs> 